I said it was a horror show. It was the worst <laughs> book I ever read, but I recommend everyone read it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're promoting the book today, The Man in the Office Next Door. Did you cry at all when you read this? Of course not. (laughs) (laughs) Real men don't cry when they read books, right? (laughs) Perfect answer. Lar, lar, pants on fire. When I was at the beach, I always like to take lots of books to read with me. Oh, okay. I took three of Pastor David Edmondson's book with me. But as I'm reading it, I am welling up in tears over and over again. And I'm the kind of person that I just don't do that. Like with movies that are sad, I I will start giggling because I know it's not real, you know? Yeah, yeah. But here I am welling up with tears in this book. And then when it gets to the plot twist, (laughs) Dennis is sitting on the couch reading something and I'm going, (laughs) I'm just crying (laughs) so hard. And what I think is, I think every minister, every believer needs to read this book and how easy it is to fall into the trap that of the vision and offense. So last night, I talked to Rick and I said, listen, I've got this book. You usually like to read electronic books, but I said, you've got to read this. I think everybody needs to read it. It's a really quick read. And this morning he called and said, I finished it. And you said, it's the word. It's the word. I said it was a horror show. It was the worst book I ever read, but I recommend everyone read it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and do you care to share why? Because it was like uh, your story. It would. I, I could have wrote the book. I, I went through that same thing in ministry. I I had a, a pastor come out from under us because of some misdeeds, and the pastor that took over. Um, um, it was ugly. It lasts complete. So what happens is is that you have. Pastor Marty Derricott is writing his viewpoint, and then Pastor David Edmondson is writing his viewpoint, telling what happened to keep these two men that loved each other. They stopped talking. Their family stopped talking. They're also related. They stopped going to get-togethers together. It caused division. It caused heartache. They had one pastor over him. I can't imagine the heartache for that. And for them to to come back and write this. Now, as I'm reading it, I was thinking, man, this, they have to be healed in order to write it. Or, or, but um, what happens is at the precipice of it, when God deals with it, it's like ripping, like yours was slow. It's still a lot of things aren't healed. But in this case, it happened in public. The Band-Aid was ripped off. All of the stuff was scooped out, and complete healing took place, which mm-hmm. was amazing. Well, the problem in the situation I was in is the the ministry at that time was not aware of or not as in tune with public confession, the need mm-hmm. to just confess yeah. and just put it out there. Um, we were big on sort of just saying, well, it's under the blood, and just kind of mm, and letting it go by. And I didn't realize the damage of that until... Um, all in all, though, it, we did get past it, and it was, it was, there was healing in it, but not in time to save that ministry. Yeah. That ministry went underwater. And, you know, that wasn't God's will for that to happen. No, it but wasn't. But he tells us in the Word that we must forgive. We must not live in offense. Offenses may come, but not to live in that. And unfortunately, there's consequences. And actually, they outline some consequences that could not be avoided. But I want to read a couple of excerpts. He does talk about what started it. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You can read that. But I knew it was going to be something dumb, silly. Yeah. That's how it is. It's never serious. Now, I'm going to read to you um, a couple things that I thought were really powerful. Uh, I don't remember if it's Marty or David who's writing this, but the venom from the bite of bitterness began to sting my heart. Anger started to simmer within me. And so then what happens is is he he begins just accusing the other one's motives is what happens. And then I I love his wording. It says, uh, they, they began to have a brawl. Now, this is church boys, pastors in a brawl. 
And he says, our punches were verbal, not physical. They were emotionally charged, vindictive, and marinated in malice. Each word was a connecting punch that landed with great voice, force and stung like alcohol hitting an open, open wound. Yep. That's, oh man, I, I just, I know what that feels like because I've been in the, the middle of offense, of yeah. offense before and it will destroy. That's why I think every pastor, every leader, every believer needs to read this book because if you think that it can't happen to you, you're crazy. These are two amazing men of God it happened to. You know, the believers you're talking about, it happened to because they, the little foxes spoil the vine. When it, the, the interesting thing is with them and in the situation that I went through was is that God doesn't stop using you because we forget mm-hmm. how many people God is reacting to besides you. You come into a service, you walk into a ministering situation. There's lots of people seeking God in those environments. There's lots of things that are happening in a lot of hearts and minds, Mm -hmm. and God is responding to everyone. And if you're the pastor, you're the minister, you're the person doing the ministering, the Holy Spirit is going to grant grace because God isn't going to intentionally punish everyone in the room because you're not where you should be. And we mistake that for some kind of uh, approval of our current attitude or our current situation. Oh, the Holy Spirit just fell like rain, so therefore I must be right with God, and that other guy must be wrong. Ooh. And that's a con- stamp of our goodness. Anything God does through us is a stamp of His goodness. Yeah, and it's also a, st- uh, a stamp of His mercy toward everyone. Mm. We're not the only one in the room. Some little girl was praying for a mother's healing. Some husband and wife were praying for a healing for their marriage. Some, somebody was praying to pass a test at school. Somebody was praying for a financial need to be met. Somebody was pr- praying for a prophetic word to, be, to, be, to deliver them from some anguish or difficulty. Somebody was doing all of this, and you're in the service, and all God cares about is the fact that you ha- are offended. And he's going to just ignore every one of those prayers. He's not going to use you to answer any of them because, of course, it's all about you. And then when he does answer those prayers, you go, oh, whew, I'm so I think I surely can't be wrong now. <laughs> and it's, I can feel that that could really make somebody upset listening to that. But it's true. We are no. not all that. No, we're not. He does, he, he's he, playing us so big. When I come into an offended situation now, and I lose all common sense for a moment, <laughs> which that's what offense is. Offense is, is the complete absence of God, and all common sense spiritually goes out the window. And that's true. I, have, I remember one time in a situation where I was upset with somebody and how I was treated. I walked around the block of my house in the rain, for four hours, and all I kept repeating to God was, Lord, I'm wrong. Help me see them the way you see them. Help me love them the way you love them. Help me understand them the way you understand them. Lord, give me grace for them the way you give grace for me. Help me wait this out. Help me understand. I just kept asking God to bring me his perspective because I knew, because I had already been through things like this before, I knew that if this didn't get handled now, yeah, it gets worse. It, the, the, it exponentially worse. It's a bit of... Division divides, and then you and this man reconciled, but you had all of the fallout of people that were still ten, divided. Ten years later, I was meeting men, meeting people who still despise this pastor, even after I no longer did. When we deliberately choose not to extend grace to others withhold forgiveness instead of releasing it to others, and allow bitterness and resentment to enter our lives due to others' actions, we open the doorway for a curse to come come upon us as Cain did. And then on 63, it says, the division affected our entire church, and now it was coming for our friends and worse yet, our families. The thing is, no one escapes. No, it's, 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 it is a nuclear option. That, that fallout cloud will poison and kill people for generations Mm -hmm. sometimes. There are whole generations of families that don't even know where the whole thing started that hate each other. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is that there is no such thing as revenge. There's just more evil. 
Mm-hmm. You're just, you know, you can hate and have such pain and suffering in your heart. Jesus is the only relief of that suffering. Nothing else takes that away. And you can get all the revenge, justice, all the compensation, all everything. And how many times have we heard somebody who's in prison, at least I did a lot of prison ministry, so I did hear this a lot, who went after somebody who did their them wrong or their family wrong, did something horrible, you know? Yeah. And they went after him and they shot him down. They, they, they killed him. They murdered him. And now they're sitting in prison and you ask them, and they'll, they'll talk to their friends. They'll go, and if I had it all to do again, I'd do it again. And I said, did you feel any better after you did it? And the answer is always the same, no. In other words, it didn't do anything for me. They were just living in some sort of fantasy world that somehow getting justice for the other person was worth it. Yeah. But it's it's it doesn't change anything it for you. It doesn't fix it whatsoever. <clears throat> when he when it started breaking apart, he said the soil around us was so unstable. My heart breaks for anyone who has drunk from this cup of offense. Whether you drank deliberately or accidentally, the intoxicating ingredients remain the same. They are unprejudiced. They are equal opportunity offenders. And I have got so many good quotes in here, but I'm going to stop at that just because, listen, please read the book, The Man in the Office Next Door by Marty Derricott and David Edmondson. I think you can find it on Amazon, or you can come here and get a copy tonight. If you, if you are ever witness to a situation like that, yeah, in, my, in my experience, when it's not you, but you are witness to it, the, the, the most important thing you can do as a Christian if you're witness to a division is begin to fast and pray and wait on the Lord and make it clear that you refuse to take a side. You will not join either camp in the dispute. You will not agree with this person. You, know, you say, you tell people when they talk about it, they say, I'm not sure what's going on there because I don't have the Lord's mind on it, but I know I'm fasting and praying and believing God for results and staying out of it. Because everybody who came through the situation I was in and didn't have the smoke of the fire on them were people who did not take a side. They just prayed and stayed out of it. Mm. And that that is that's your only option if you see that going down. You Satan will tell you, oh, you need to go counsel with that one, or you need to have a meeting with that one, or you need to do this or do that. Mm-hmm. Nope. It's just like fire. Drop, stop, and roll, drop, stop, and pray. <laughs> stop, <laughs> drop, and pray. Because you're you 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 had just ha- all you can do is put water on the fire, and that's only the fasting and prayer of the saints. See you later. See you later. <laughs>